the end goal is to really have cash flow. Agreed. Because cash flow is actually, that's real wealth there, Agreed. right? There's a difference of being wealthy versus being rich. Rich is money today, but with high inflation, that gets rolled away. But once you have wealth where you're having constant cash flow coming in, dude, that's that's forever. Yeah. What's going on, everybody? Austin Zayback here with another episode of the Austin Zayback Show. We have a, a special guest today, uh, Chuck Hitz, and uh, I'm probably still uh, pronouncing your name wrong, so I do apologize. You, you did a pretty good job. I did a better job yeah. that time. Okay. Um, you know, look, guys, this guy is somebody who's been in real estate for over a decade. Uh, last year alone, did over $100 million in total sales volume. Very humble dude. And, uh, you know, just have an opportunity to sit down with him here today, kind of hear his story, what he's working on. Uh, he's really successful on the platform of YouTube, has generated a ton of business doing YouTube videos with over 200,000 subscribers. And uh, brother, I appreciate you being here, man. Well, thanks for having me. It's actually an honor to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it, dude. I love it. So we were just talking a little yeah. bit before the show. You've been in real estate for 11 years now? Yeah, going on 11 years, I believe. Okay, awesome. And you're so from long, I can't even remember. Was that always in Vegas? I know you mentioned that you went to um, Charlotte for a while. Yeah, I went out to Charlotte, North Carolina. But yeah, um, so I've been out in Vegas now for about 20 years. But, you know, starting from the beginning, I think around like 2008 uh, during the market crash, you know, I was just detailing cars. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. But during this time period, this is before like iPhones and all that stuff. This is uh, MP3 players. I don't, I don't know if you remember that or not. I do. I do. But uh, there was a guy I used to listen to. His name was Judson Voss. Okay. He specializes in subject to like financing. Right. And I decided that I was going to go out there. I scraped up every single dollar I had. And at that time, $3,000 is a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Right. So went out there for two days, hung out with him, figure out the subject twos. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to come back to Vegas. I'm going to crush it. Let's do this. Then when I got back to Vegas, I had like a box full of books <laughs> and that that was it. Yeah. I didn't really I didn't know what to do at that point. Right. I literally needed somebody to walk me through the process. So I took about a week trying to figure out how to do all this. and I couldn't figure it out because you, you physically need somebody to help you walk you through the process. I didn't have a mentor. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So during this time period. I felt like maybe now's the time to buy a house because when I was listening to all these podcasts during this time period, every wealthy person had real estate in their mm. portfolio. So that's all I would listen to as I was detailing cars, right? Yep. How to make money, how to invest. So I decided to purchase a home and I thought I knew what I was doing <laughs> at this point, right? Because you listen to so much podcasts and you're like, okay, I'm an expert now. Sure. But my first deal wasn't really a good deal. <laughs> but uh, I, I bought this home in 2009 from this agent. And um, I told him that, hey, I wanna get into real estate investing. I was thinking about possibly becoming an appraiser. Mm. He says, no, you don't wanna do that. I said, why? He says, you're not gonna make any money. Yep. So I said, okay. He goes, why don't you become a real estate agent? I'll take you under my wing, because I see that you're a hustler, and I'm gonna show you, my, I'm gonna show you the ropes. Yep. So I said, okay, let's do it. So I went out, went out got my license, after I got my license, you know, I hung my license with his company. And we started doing deals together. Probably about six months after I decided to break away, I went over to Keller Williams. You know okay. Keller Williams. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because I felt like I needed a little bit more, more training. Mm -hmm. So I went over to Keller Williams, got a little bit more training, which is a great company if you're sure. just getting started. Mm -hmm. And at that point, now I started working with investors. Gotcha. And this is, you know, during a crash, things are low. We had over like 18,000 homes on the market. Homes that were selling for like 450000 were like 60000 Wow. I didn't have no money. Mm. I was still detailing cards at the same time, but still trying to find myself and also trying to transition into a full-time real estate agent. During that time period, I told my wife, I just want to be a full-time real estate agent. I could just make $36,000 a year. <laughs> That's all I want, right? Yeah. I just want to do this for yeah. a living. Yeah. So I was doing that, worked with a couple investors, really starting to learn the lingo and the terms, how to analyze deals. And all, all I would do is find deals for these guys. Mm. But it was good practice. But I wasn't really making that much money, sure. right? Because $80,000 on a 3% commission is really nothing. Yeah. But I didn't care. But it was enough to survive. So during that time period, as I was going along, I had friends that was also doing like short sales. And I got into the short sale game as well because obviously there were so much properties on the market. They were literally giving this stuff away. So I learned a short sale business and 
as I was building my cash reserves, yeah. I bought one property, bought two, flipped a couple. Then, you know, I'd find properties where, hey, you know, if somebody wanted to wholesale it, I would do a couple sure. wholesales here and there. So I was pretty much trying to make money every way I could. Yeah. So then from there, you know, I, I got with an attorney and she specializes in short sales because, you know, as an agent, mm -hmm. number one, you don't want to do the short sales because the paperwork takes forever. Yep. And I didn't really know too much about short sales. But what I knew was, hey, I needed to get somebody mm -hmm. to do the heavy lifting because I could go out and get the business. The yeah. business was the easy part, right? Right. So I had this attorney would help me out and she would do all the filings, all the paperwork during this time period. And what I would do is just, just get the listings, mm -hmm. get the back end buyer. Sometimes we would have, you know, double in the deal, which was great. And we would sell it to investors too as well. Yeah. So at one period, we that's all I was doing. Wow. But we talked about this earlier where real estate, what's fascinating about real estate, especially in Las Vegas, it's such a trendy city mm -hmm. that the market shifts in a dime, yep. literally within seven days. It could go from a buyer to a seller's market. And basically that's what was happening in Vegas because it's such a trendy uh, city where the market constantly shifts and you yeah. always got to see what's going on to stay in front of it. It's a, tour it's a touristy destination. I mean, yeah. it's totally different, I'd yeah. imagine, than a market. It's similar in a lot of ways, I yeah. think, to a market like Phoenix. And at the same time, I think it's totally different. Well, I tell you what, Phoenix is more humid than Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's humid today, dude. Yeah, yeah. It just rained a bunch. Yeah. Um, I love that. So then then all of a sudden you're doing short sales. Mm -hmm. And then after that, what, what ended up happening after that? What took place after you kind of got through the crash and everything like that. Now it's, you okay, know. Okay, so after I got a, you know, going through the crash at that point, um, I decided I wanted to build a team, all right? At one point, uh, I had a team of, I think a total of 12 agents because a lot of agents get into this business and the first thing that they want to do is they watch million dollar listings. I was one of those guys where like, <laughs> hey, I want to be big. I want to wear the suits and tie because I was that guy that drove the BMW, the suit and tie, the car sales guy and I just hired a bunch of people, right? Because right. I was generating leads, right? And during this time, the way I was also generating leads was through Craigslist. Wow. And I did Craigslist probably for maybe about a year where we were actually taking the links from the website and embedding it into the post, mm -hmm. right? Where you could literally go on Craigslist, click the link, and you can see what was going on and we can upload the pictures. So I paid somebody to do hundreds of posts every single day. So that's where a lot of our business was coming in. And during this time, we had probably about 12 agents, but where I really made the mistake was the leads were okay, but I was not a good coach. Mm. And that's what I realized because you're gonna have people that could teach and educate people, but you need to identify that right away. Right. I'm not one of those guys. What I'm good at is getting the business. Mm. So you have to have certain people in place, which is you know what I realized. So. Yeah. How did you end up realizing that? Like, I feel like that's like something that I feel like a lot of people, their ego gets in the way yeah. or their whatever, you know, their pride and they're not able to like look in the mirror and realize, you know, their strengths and their weaknesses. I and mean, what, at what moment did you realize like, man, like I'm, I'm great at all these other things, but I'm not, I'm not a coach. Uh, probably about like 60 days ago. No, uh, <laughs> I would say probably about a year ago, to be honest okay. with you, because like you said, with the ego and stuff like that, um, I had so much pride and I felt like I should have did all this myself, but then realized I'm just, it's just not me. I'm not good at it. Yeah. But sometimes you got to step away from your business and kind of reevaluate and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But it literally took me about nine to 10 years to really figure this thing out yeah. because I was trying to do everything myself. And that was another thing I learned in this business. You can't do everything yourself. But one thing that I've learned is it's good to understand all positions. Yep. And another thing I was running into a problem was I was very controlling mm -hmm. versus taking one person, right? Identifying what they're good at and exploiting that yep. and let them do what they do. Let and them it, run with it. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's my way or not, as long as it's getting done. Yeah. So that was hard for me too as well, but it's like business. You got to learn yeah. and you grow. You and, and then that's where the first step is. You, you have to identify that. And then I think that's like one of the hardest steps is to actually identify it. Mm -hmm. But once you identify it, then you can say, Hey, this is what we're going to do. It's time to reposition. Let, let's do it this way. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, yeah, there's so many. I've, I don't think I've ever met an entrepreneur that got that figured out the first time. Like yeah. the, the delegation and the mm -hmm. not micromanaging and the uh, don't try to do it all yourself or the 
identifying your own strengths and weaknesses. You know, there's the book, uh, I don't know if you've read it, like Rocket Fuel. Mm -mm. Um, it, it just talks about the visionary and the integrator, right? Yeah. And how you have these two distinct like roles where you've got the visionary that is like the guy that comes up with all the ideas and yeah. can see the future very clearly, but really is not the best integrator, right? Yes. Like he, and then you've got the integrator that maybe can't quite fully see the future or what it could look like, but they're really good at sitting behind the computer and integrating everything, yeah. right? And then, of course, you've got all, a bunch of other roles as well. Um, I, I'm still working on that myself, you know, the delegation and the everything mm -hmm. like that. And I think a lot of that we were talking before the show um, is where the culture comes from, yeah. right? Because yeah, I've done it in the past where, like, I'm micromanaging everybody similar to, like, you're yeah. talking about. And you end up having a crappy culture, yeah. right, where people aren't happy. They really they don't feel like they can speak their, you know, mind or whatever. They think you're just going to shoot every idea down and... Um, I've been on that roller coaster in my life as well. So. Yeah, and one of the problems I always had was I always try to be the smartest guy in the room or be the dominant one, but sometimes you got to pull back. Mm. And if you're the smartest guy in the room, then there's actually a problem. So now the guys that I put in place are guys that are actually better than me. So wow. let me give an example. I, I have a, a coach, right, that trains a team. His name is Joey, and he's good at what he does. I just manage him, mm. but then he manages as a team because he's a good coach. Because I can't coach. Yep. So these are the things that I've learned as I've, you know, ran a business and from from time. You know what yeah. I mean? It just takes time. Yeah. But the the hard part is to identifying it and stepping out of yourself and say, hey, you got to make these yeah. corrections. You got to make these changes. I totally agree with that, and I love what you said. I do the very same thing in my company now. Um, I have a sales manager. I yeah. we walked by him a little while ago, and uh, you know he he's the one coaching all my agents now. You know, don't yeah. get me wrong. I'll do meetings here and there yeah. and I try to be there where I can. I introduce myself and whatever, but I'm the face. I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. Yeah. Like, this is what I'm good at, right? I'm good at talking to dudes like you. I can mm -hmm. sit here, we could talk all day. But when it comes to sitting down with each individual agent and formulating a game plan of how many open houses to sit every week, yeah. like I'm not the guy. Yeah. You know, I just, for number one, I lose interest. I'm just mm -hmm. not, I'm not like, I can't focus. I'm like, man, like I gotta, I gotta get the hell out of here, you know? Yeah. Um, so I totally agree, man. So now you've got uh, six agents. So you're on a, a yeah. smaller team now, right? Yeah. But, you know, in all honesty, uh, having six agents, you said last year you did roughly 100 and 120 million, give or take. Yeah, okay. we, we did a lot. So basically the, the people that we actually hire are top producers yeah. and they perform. And what I realized by hiring these agents, we need to identify two things. Are they a chief or they're an Indian, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can only have one chief in the room. And that's just the bottom line. But then there are really good Indians out there. They don't care about being in front of the camera. What they care about is, look, are we going to be successful? Right. Like our agents are making over half a million dollars, mm -hmm. right, at the end of the day. So like, like Joey, this guy, he doesn't want to be in front of the camera. He doesn't need to be because he's a part of the team, yeah. right? He's part of that culture, like he's saying. So at the end of the day, my job is just to go out there to get business. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I'm the lead, you know, lead singer, but sometimes it just yeah. ends up that way. But it doesn't matter because the drummer is just as cool as the singer, right? I love that. So I love that analogy. So what are you doing right now um, for your for your agents? You know, obviously lead generation is huge, right? We were talking yeah. before the show. You were asking me, you know, how I maintain, um, basically, you know, how I keep agents on my team, right? Yeah. And I said to you, I said, hey, it's culture and. And kind of what we're talking about right now, generating leads. You know, mm -hmm. now I know you have that YouTube channel, which I, which blows me away every time I look at it. Like yeah. the, the views that you get on every freaking video. You know, so I, I would imagine you've got a lot of leads coming in from all of that that you do, right? Yes. Is there anything else you do? Do you work with Zillow? Do you do any other? No. Uh, with my business right now, we're we are only focusing on listings right now. Uh, we're do, obviously doing the YouTube thing. And also paper ad clicks, okay. social media as well, you know, Instagram, TikTok. So we're getting leads like that. So we're generating anywhere from about 450 buyer leads to 500 every single month. Got it. And that's more than enough because our database right now alone is about 41,000. So, I mean, there's there's a lot to filter through. Yep. But on the selling side, we have a probably about like 20,000 leads. I love that. And we do, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Land Voice where we yeah. do, you know, you make four calls at one time. Yep. So Basically, that's what we're doing now, too, as well. Okay. And we're sending out, like, letters, and we're doing past clients. So we have enough business that it, that is coming in where everybody's getting fed, yep. but enough to grow, too, as well. Now, I know, you know, from my experience, getting agents to sit down and make calls or do anything like that mm -hmm. can sometimes be difficult, right? Yeah. 
Um, and I've even implemented ISAs and tried to, you know, streamline the process. And we're working on a lot of that right now where, you know, agents can just go on the, the, the listing appointment. They, yeah. all they got to do is just show up to the appointment. They don't got to make 500 calls a day or whatever. Yeah. Right. How have you dealt with that? I mean, do you, is there, or do you just make your agents make the calls and like accountability? Okay. So basically every agent, I know exactly what percentage of the income they would produce me every year. So I, I look, I constantly look at the numbers. We have meetings like every, you know, two weeks with the team, yep. but I don't do the coaching, but we will all meet together. We'll go have some lunch or breakfast, or we'll go do something together as a team, but we'll want, we will run the numbers and see the data. Right. Mm -hmm. And it speaks for itself. If they're not producing, why are they not producing? Right. Yep. Is it, is it because of the calls they are not making the calls? If they're not making the calls, what is the motivation? And that's what we get down to. Because the guys that really do produce in this industry is because they have some sort of motivation. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to, yep. right? Um, you know, one person may have a family that has to feed his kids, and he may have a nut that's like twenty thousand dollars a month. That's a pretty big motivation. Yeah. So it's a case by case basis, but sure. we we try to identify every agent because it's very unique. Then from there we kind of um, you know reverse prospect and kind of break it down. Yeah and we kind of figure out what's going on, then we try to help out those agents within that section. Because you, you know you may have an agent that makes like, let's say 100 calls, yep. but if they're not converting or sending appointments within 100 calls, what is your conversion rate? If, you, right. if it's only two, you're sending two appointments, that, that's a pretty weak conversion rate. Yep. So it tells me that you're probably your phone skills are not that great, right. right? But again, that's a little bit more out of my wheelhouse. Sure. Like I said, we, we have a manager that kind of runs and deals with all that. So I, it's kind of very, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question. Sure. Yeah, so. of course. Yeah. But no, it's a good answer. Yeah. I think, I think you provided a really good answer and it, it, you know, I think running a team is always so interesting, right? Yeah. Cause traditionally when you, when I, I think I told you, I never thought about running a team. Right. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, I always looked at the team model and I'm like, man, they're not profitable. Like they're 10% profit margin, yeah. 12, 12%, 15% profit margin. If you're lucky, like mm -hmm. if you, if you've got every freaking thing figured out in the world, you know, and I mean, I'm not saying you can't make more than that. You certainly can. But running a team is challenging, right? Yeah. A, a real estate, a residential real estate team. It's why I wholesale and it's why we flip and we buy rentals and we do everything else that we do, because uh, I, I don't think I would want to just run a team. So is there anything else that you do? Do you do you have you ever flipped before? Are you uh, building a rental portfolio at all? Well, right now we have a rental portfolio of only six properties. Okay. Like like I said, you know, I'm not that big real estate guru okay. guy. That's not me. I'm just an average guy that, you know, was able to make seven figures just through, you know, residential yeah. sales, take some of that money, buy investment properties. But we own all our investment properties free and clear. That's awesome. But um, the properties that I decide that I want to flip, I never flip them because yeah. – for me, it's about the cash flow. Like, if I can consistently make ninety thousand dollars a a year yep. in my cash flow of properties, is it worth for me to sell? Do you know what right. I mean? Because it really feels good now. I'm to the point where we were able to get enough, you know, properties that pay for all our expenses. So everything that we make today yep. is pretty much all profit. It's all awesome. spending money. Yeah. And our overhead is so low because. You know, we don't really have any bills between yep. me and my wife, right? Sure. The, the most expensive bill is my mortgage, which is like nine hundred and thirty dollars a month. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but, love but that. I mean, yeah, I mean, other than that, yeah. it's like everything that we do is one hundred percent profit. Yeah. So it's like, okay, should I liquidate this and make you know two million dollars? Yeah, I could do that now, but why what's out you? there? Yeah, why would why I? Why would you? Yeah. So it, it's a case by case basis. Yeah. But um, I am I am planning on selling a few so that way I can reposition because yep. one thing in that I learned with single family detach it's kind of hard to manage like six properties yeah. right because I'm late on one sewage bill here and another one here so I'm trying to consolidate everything reposition and probably take four million dollars and roll that over into yeah. like a forty six a unit apartment building and that that's kind of like the end goal for me yeah I think yeah. that's a really good strategy and I'm I'm actually pretty similar to you. In that front right now, um, you know, I, I don't have a big rental portfolio, own yeah. a couple, own a couple free and clear, have a couple with a mortgage on them, like 40% LTV, yeah. you know, which um, is great. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, but very similar, you know, I do eventually want to own a lot more rentals, yeah. but I want to do it the right way. Yeah. I don't want to just, you know, I think a lot of people, they, they have this massive portfolio that they own 1% of, mm -hmm. and it's like 90% LTV, you know, it's like, or, uh, you know, 90% debt. That's dangerous. Right? And it's a dangerous place to yeah. be in, you know? And, and so um, I'm more of a, 
I'd rather I'm I'm here for the marathon. Yeah, I, I'm here to like I want to be in the game in 30 years. You yeah, know, I want to I want to keep playing the game, and so I really like that strategy. I think it's a really cool strategy. And um, when you were buying those properties over time, I'd imagine you bought those six properties over the last what decade, give or yeah. take. Yeah. Okay. When you were buying those over time, did you buy them outright in cash, like as you would, you know, make your money in your businesses? And obviously, you're good at with your money, yeah. so you would, you know, constantly be putting money aside. Or would you get a loan and then just pay them off real quick? Like, how did they become free um, and clear? I think on my first deal, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, this home was only like sixteen thousand wow. dollars, but it was dilapidated, right? Yeah. And uh, you had like drug users like living wow. in this home. But uh, what I did was this during a short sale period. That's how I got my first deal. I find out I found out where the owner lived through you know the county, right? Went out and knocked on their door and said, "Hey, look, let me short sell your home." We'll give you five thousand dollars. We're gonna help you out, right? So we gave him the five thousand dollars. Did the short sale. I bought it for sixteen thousand, and uh, once we closed on it, the county came back and said, "Hey, you have a lien against this property, like thirty-two thousand dollars." I said, "No, here we own this property. Not only that, we have title insurance." So the title company had to eat like thirty-two thousand dollars. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> so now yeah. that I took possession of this property, right? And this is one of the first videos I did, right? I literally had to gut this whole house. And um, the, the home was built in like the early 40s. So mm -hmm. this is when we had like cast iron plumbing and stuff sure. like that. Sewage line would rot it away. And as I was going through this process of the rehab, I was in Arizona watching a Cardinals game. Okay. And uh, the contractor called me up and he goes, hey, the sewage line is screwed up. Oh, I was like, what do you mean? All right? Because I'm going through my whole first flip. All yeah. right. And he was like, yeah, it's cast iron. It, it's all collapsed. And he's like, we need a whole new one to the city. He's like, so I asked him, how much is it going to cost? He's like, $20,000. And I'm at a football game, yeah. paranoid. And I was like, all right, we had no choice to do it. So I came back. There's like literally like holes cut into a concrete wow. throughout the whole house. All the walls are down because I ran all new plumbing, all new electrical, copper lining. But at the end of the day, I think I was all in, probably about $85,000 at that point. And I was scared. Yep. But it was actually the best learning experience, and here's why. Because during this time, you could have paid any company out there fifty, thirty thousand dollars to learn how to flip a home. Sure. I figured, why do this when I could just go through the process myself, learn as I go, and spend my own money? And yeah. that was like the best learning lesson ever. Wow. So it literally taught me how to hire the right crew, mm -hmm. make sure I'm not getting ripped off. If something like this happens, I have a general idea how much the AC costs, how much the electrical, sure. how much is the plumbing. So it, it was a great experience. But yeah. today that home is worth about 350000 So I'm ahead of the game, but during that time period, uh, homes were only going for like 120. Yeah. So I probably would have only made like 30000 if for I sure. flipped it at that time. But I, I held on to it. it. Yeah. Well, my whole goal was to rehab it and just to save it for the long haul. And the good news is that because I flipped that whole property, right, from ground up, uh, what was nice about it was I knew that property was going to last for another 30 years. Sure. So I still have that home today. Yep. However, one of the biggest mistakes I did make on that deal was I over rehabbed the home. Mm, gotcha. I was like, yo, this is my baby. Yeah. I want to do this. And <laughs> now I, I still do that till this day. Only on our last flip that we just did, we just rehabbed. I only did it for 10 grand. Got it. Okay. So I, I tend to get a little emotionally attached to this and do the overkill. But the good news is that I'm buying these properties dirt cheap enough. It gives me that wiggle room yeah. to do it because I feel like if I rehab this just a little bit better than everybody else, right, I can squeeze that much more on the monthly payments. And that's how I feel. So I agree with you. Yeah. And I think even, even if you were to flip and, yeah. and you – had the right margin, right? Yeah. You bought it at the right deal. I was I was actually doing a training the other day and I said, look, I said, we're going into a market where flippers can make a lot of money again, mm -hmm. but buyers are going to go view four properties or eight properties yep. on a Saturday and they're going to buy their favorite one. Correct. Right? And and that the favorite one will most likely be the one that the flipper did the best job on, mm -hmm. right? So it's no longer, you know, for the last couple of years, dude, any flipper, you could like put a new ceiling fan up and make 30 grand. I mean, yeah. and it could look like crap because people didn't have an option, right? Mm -hmm. They needed somewhere to live. But now that you have a little more inventory, I think that, you know, maybe going the extra mile, again, if you can afford to, yeah. if you have the margin, uh, is really the best thing, right? And, and for a rental, 
I think for a rental man, like I've always looked at it like this. Like if I plan to hold that property long term, yeah. right? Dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm either gonna do it now or I'm gonna do it later. Yeah. You know, like whatever it is that I'm doing, right? Like I may as well just do it right now. I see a lot of uh, uh, landlords that try to cut corners, and then in five years, it's like everything's all jacked up. If you're a real estate agent or a real estate investor, one of my favorite tools that I use every single day in my own personal real estate companies is www.topredata.com. Top RE Data, you can actually get a seven day free trial. And there are so many different amazing features you can do with this particular software. This is how we comp a lot of our properties. This is how we skip trace a lot of owners, how we get in touch with people, how we identify leads, do all kinds of different research on all the different properties. They have mobile, they have desktop, and there's comprehensive data nationwide, which is incredible. You can do just about anything with topredata.com. You can find divorces, you can find tax defaults, you can literally find any kind of data that you're looking for, get information, get owner information, contact information. You can even automate different things, you can target different things, and even build out your entire team with topredata.com. So again, if you're a real estate agent or a real estate investor and you are interested, make sure to go ahead and sign up for your free trial uh, for seven days at www.topredata.com. It's like you could have just done it in the beginning. Yeah, it you know? just costs you more money in the long run. Right. I mean, there's certain things that I'll do to like a rental property. You know, we'll do tile and stuff like that so that way it lasts longer. Yep. But, um, you know, I'm talking two sides out of my butt because this last one we did, <laughs> we just did carpet because I, I'm, I'm going to probably flip this property, yep. but I may rent it. I'm not too sure yet, but it actually turned out pretty good. Don't you think, York? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what's the price point of the one you're talking about so, right now? So the one that I'm talking about right now, I think we picked this one up for 200. It's worth about 265. Okay. Put 10 grand into it. Not so bad. it's not bad of a flip. Single family? Yeah. No, it's just a condo. A condo. Sing, okay. Yeah, single family. It's like two get, bedroom, two bath. Yeah, two bedroom, something two like bath. That. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've got a I've got a little two bed, two bath condo. We picked up for we actually stole it. We picked it up for 105. Oh but wow. Probably 15 into it. It's worth like 230. Wow. So not bad. Yeah. So, Stole it. You murdered it. <laughs> yeah, we murdered that one, dude. We murdered that one. That, and we, I still own that one. Uh, yeah. We bought that one like a year ago, and I just rented it out, mm -hmm. you know? So um, that one I, is one we own free and clear. So, yeah, I mean, it's just like I, I love real estate, man. Mm -hmm. You were talking a little while ago about how you can vertically integrate and be nimble and, and, yeah. and do all these different forms of real estate, and I think it's really cool. And you do a lot of what we do in the grand scheme of things. I mean, you – you wholesaled many times. Yeah. How many deals would you say you've wholesaled in your career? In my career, probably about maybe like 38 okay. of them, uh, which is I should have bought them all myself. But man, I'm like, oh, yeah. now that I'm thinking about it, because the market has dramatically just increased like crazy. Wholesaling is probably the that that is the blessing and the curse of wholesaling. Yeah. Is basically most wholesale deals, arguably, if you're about to sell it to somebody else and yeah. they have enough profit to mm -hmm. buy at a higher number than you have it at, yeah. then it almost means almost every time that you should probably be buying it, right? Yeah. But you get addicted to wholesaling because of the cash flow. Well, because you need the money at that right. time, but at, at the end of the day, you, you do have to wholesale, or you know, if you're an agent, you, you want to make as much as money as you can, you want to stack it, then you want to take that money and deploy it back out into the marketplace and buy your own stuff, because yep. that's the only way to build wealth, right? But if you're just yep. making that money and you're just spending it, then you know you're not doing it the right way. Yeah. And especially if you're in the real estate game, I mean, I think the end goal is to really have cash flow. Agreed. Because cash flow is actually that's real wealth there. Agreed. Right. There's a difference of being wealthy versus being rich. Rich is money today, but with high inflation, that gets rolled away. But once you have wealth where you're having constant cash flow coming in, dude, that's that's forever. Yeah. And I totally agree. That's why I'm kind of teeter tottering. Hey, should I liquidate yeah. some like? This one property that we have for sale right now, we just went under contract. We're going to net about $200,000, but I still got to pay taxes on it. So right. I'll probably be left with 160000 But the question is, do I sell or do I rent? But obviously, the math never lies. So if you run the numbers, this makes sense. So if we make 160 profit, but I'm, if I'm only cash flowing like $800 a month, you take that, you times that by 12. What is that like? What? Uh, 8000 yeah. 96 Yep. So you take 96 divided by 100, 160,000. That tells you that's how long you have to hold on to that property just to break to get even. That money back. Exactly. Yep. Versus taking 160,000 dollars 
allocating mm. that money and repositioning your yep. portfolio. So that that's like a whole nother level yep. of investing because once you accumulate these cash flow properties, now it's, hey, let's take a look at yep. our properties. How do we reposition the scale? Yep. That's all, this is all it's about. It's all about sure. scaling. So that, that's where I'm at right now. How's the multifamily game in Vegas? Is it is it doable? No, not at okay. all. Um, here's the thing, especially up to four units, they want $500,000, wow. which is unbelievable. That's like $125,000 per door. Yep. These doors are only giving you probably about 1000 to $1,200 a month. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense if you leverage out your money by putting down 20, 30, even 40%. Wow. These yields, these returns are less than 3%. Wow. Like, dude, I could take my money and go get something else. For sure. So when you were talking a little while ago about eventually posi uh, potentially repositioning yeah. and maybe accumulating some multifamily, yeah. what market would you identify? Or like, is there a particular part of the country where you're like, man, like if I was going to get into the multifamily game, it would be in this part of the country? That is a very good question because I'm such a novice at this, right? I think I'm going to plant in my backyard first, okay. right? And just kind of go bigger, more units then? Yes, correct. How do you overcome the five hundred thousand, you know, twelve hundred a month, like the smaller? You got to go what thirty units? I mean, yeah. For me, uh, to make sense, I need to be at least twenty units and above. Okay. And the returns that I'm looking for is probably unrealistic at this time because of the market is just way too high. I want to at least have an eight yep. percent cap rate or higher. But these are probably going to be in more of a D class neighborhood right. or C class, which is fine to me because I'm going to be looking for add value properties. Gotcha. So that's my my goal here is to go in probably all cash, do an add value, raise the rents, rehab it, and you know just take the money out and reposition, and do it again. Yep. Then pr you know probably from there I'm going to document everything on YouTube because we actually have a second channel. Okay. So I'm literally going to show you from ground up, everything I'm doing, all the mistakes. And at that point, I think I'm gonna raise some funds and uh, I love that. You know, move on. Yeah, so I that, love that. So that's kind of like the end goal. Okay, for sure. And what does something like that run, you think? I mean, in a, obviously in this market, we're crazy, but a couple million bucks, I mean, what? Yeah, so for like a 30 unit right now, you can buy a 30 unit in Vegas for about 4 million, okay. which is still too high. Too high, Cap yeah. rate's only at 3%. I mean, yeah. dude, inflation is like at 9.1%. Something's it, gotta give that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Eventually sure. it will because yeah. the financing, it just doesn't make any sense. These investors are gonna start to realize maybe I need to drop the price. So yeah. that's why I'm sitting with my powder dry, yep. repositioning, just kind of watching the market. But if I find a good deal for a single family resident, don't get me wrong, I'm still pulling the trigger because I'm still writing offers on single family residents because if the numbers make sense, I'm moving forward. Not only that, it allows me to create content too as well. Sure. So it doesn't even matter. I love that. Because we're making money off of that too as well. So Yeah, I love that. So you live a pretty simple life. You're yeah. you're, you're minimalist like yeah. to, to a certain degree, right? How have you been able to do that? I think a lot of people struggle with, they, they look at other people's highlight reel. Mm -hmm. They think they need the Lamborghini and the freaking, you know, the watches and the whole thing, right? How do you, how do you be disciplined to build wealth? Because really that's what building wealth is all about, yeah. right? It's about being disciplined and maybe not living a glamorous life for a decade, right? How have you been able to do that? I think it's probably where I was raised, right? Kind of like in a poverty area. Like, you know, I'm originally from Hawaii, so if you go back to Hawaii and see where I live, you, you'll start to realize, hey, this is not like uh, how it is on, on the movies, like Hawaii Five O, right? Right. So, you know, a lot of people have that kind of like that poverty mentality, the scarcity, where like, hey, I want to hold on to things, right? So for me, I have to make calculated moves, right? And I think what it is is by reading books, I always like to listen to audio books. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm constantly just embedding all this information, and that's how I kind of stay on course. But who also helps me out is actually my wife. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, you know, think I'm grounded, but I'm not grounded, and I'm like, yo, let's do this. But then you have to have a partner that we're on the same page. Yeah. So sometimes she'll, she'll pull me back and say, hey, we got to stay back on track. But I've always been like this, you know, since day one. And I think what it comes down to, it's it's how we were raised, you know. In addition to that, it's a, it's the people that we surround ourselves with and the things that, you know, I'm just interested in, right? Sure. Because I'm interested in economics. I'm interested in financing and making money and learning how to grow and build myself yeah. personally. So I love that. And I do want to talk about that uh, for a quick minute. You know, I think that relationships are crucial yeah. to success. I think a relationship can make a break, make yeah. or break you, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're yeah. somebody that wants to go become successful, and you're with the wrong person, mm -hmm. right? So, how long have you been with your your wa your wife? 
Oh, I think we've been married now about <laughs> 16 years. She's going to wow. kill me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So yeah. 16 years, give or take. Yeah. <laughs> Six, you're right on the money. You got it perfect. Um, but, you know, how did you guys meet? Did you date a long time before you got no, married? No, uh, I actually, uh, when I first moved out here to Vegas, um, you used to go night clubbing, right? And I had one of my good friends. Uh, his dad was a pastor. Okay. And uh, we used to party, like, Saturday nights. And on Sunday, we would literally go to church, uh -huh. right? right after the nightclub and this is probably like eight in the morning we're going to church yep and uh that's where i met her at church wow that's awesome did yeah. you tell her where you were at the, the night before oh she knew <laughs> she knew <laughs> okay um and so you guys have been together for a really long time yeah now. congratulations by appreciate the way that. uh how ha would you say that you know having her be by your side has helped has it helped you become who you are today oh yeah that's a that plays a big part she's also a transaction coordinator and a transaction wow. manager for the team too as well so she helps me run all the files because obviously we, we I can't do the files, sure. right? But, um, you know, we sat down. We, we had a conversation. We have the same goals, right? She's very conservative as well. And um, basically we have just these goals and we have the financial goals and we're just hitting those targets because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, we, we don't have, you know, 401ks and stuff like that, right? We have to create that for ourselves. Sure. So I, I think that's that, that's what really helps. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that is so crucial. I think viewers like and listeners can get a ton yeah. of value from from that. Choosing the right partner, yeah. somebody that supports you. You could sit down, you can talk mm -hmm. to them, uh, goal set, you know, actually be on the same page. What's like the biggest thing you can attribute such a successful marriage? Obviously, every every relationship has, you know, yeah. its ups and downs. But um, that's a good question. It's, this is it. And people ask me all this time when it comes to merits, it's just communication. Yeah, That's all it is. You know, you can get mad at the other person, right? That's fine. But at the end of the day, as long as you always have a line of communication mm. and just, just sit down and have that conversation. If you're not happy, why are you not happy? Yeah. Sometimes it may take a second, right? For me, I'm just like this, boom. Yeah. I'm good. I can get mad within two seconds, bipolar. Hey, you know what? Let's have a <laughs> conversation. Yeah. So sometimes the other spouse may take a little bit longer. But for me, I just realized... When it comes to relationships, it just comes down to communication I at the end that. of the day. Yeah. And I think that really sums up life, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny. I'm fascinated by relationships and business and entrepreneurship and yeah. partnerships. And you look at a successful business partner, right? It's communication. Mm -hmm. If me and my business partner aren't communicating properly, yeah. the, the relationship is going to fail, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm not communica uh, communicating with my significant other, the relationship will eventually fail. Yeah. And I think that... Um, you know, just good communication in general yeah. is so gosh dang important. And I know? think you also have to be honest with each other too as well because sometimes you can have that communication, but that one person or that business partner may not really say what he or she really wants to say. And it's very important to really express your feelings yeah. so that way you, you understand where that person is coming from. So that way now we can make those adjustments and now we can actually adapt. Because you can always compromise, right? Because like I told you earlier, my way may not be the right way. Yep. It doesn't matter how it gets done as long as it gets done, right? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what's like one thing that you've learned just in general over the last decade that has helped you become successful? Like we all go through trials and tribulations, right? And it could be really anything spiritually, emotionally, personally, um, something that you've, you've learned and taken with you as you've faced struggles and adversity and, and all, all sorts of different things. I'm going to tell you this. I, I was never like a religious guy, but now, you know, being in the position that I, I, I'm in, I'm able to bless my family. Mm. And what I mean by that, it's like we're just to a point already where money's really no object. Right. But what gr gives me gratification is that I could take my family out and go have dinner and don't worry about the bill. Mm. And what I'm trying to get to is this. It's when, when things are going bad, I feel like, you know what, business is not going great. And I like to bless people. And what I mean by that is I like to tide by giving people things, right? Like money, like if I see somebody or they need help, I, I just give, just yeah. give. And I don't know if I'm getting more religious as I, I'm getting older, but I, I feel like it's karma, I mm, guess. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is. And that's one thing that I learned where when, when you're feeling down, you got to have that faith. I that. And I, I feel like, that's my way of giving back in faith. Like, hey, you know what? Business is not going good. Here's $100. Here's $200, yeah. you know, just to random people. 
and and that's for me that's the right thing to do yeah I, and i think wow it, it, it's so powerful yeah. you know i think that it, you're almost like shifting that focus yeah in, in, mentally you're 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 coming at it with an abundance yeah. mindset of hey i'm gonna help people around me and serve mm -hmm. people and i'm gonna put my i'm gonna take the focus off of me yeah and off of the lack right and i'm gonna put it back on other people and on abundance mm -hmm. and I, I think you're 100% right. I think no matter what you believe in, yeah. it's phenomenal karma. Yeah. Deal Machine is one of the ways that we're able to drive around any neighborhood throughout the entire country and in real time figure out the contact information of the owner's property. It's how we organize everything and how we send our entire team out to drive for dollars. This is a phenomenal way if you're looking to get your first wholesale deal on a budget or if you're doing multiple wholesale deals a month. I really do believe in Deal Machine, and we've gotten over a hundred deals driving for dollars. If you want to go ahead and sign up for a seven-day free trial, just go to go ahead and go to www.topd4d.com and make sure to use the promo code Zayback. Now let's go ahead and get back to the show. What, what's one of the biggest challenges that you faced over the last you know ten years in business, and and it could be you know leadership, it could be uh, you know, diving deep, it, it could be, it could be really anything, but a challenge that you faced that in the moment you were like, man, like, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do here. I think for me, it's really coming to grips with myself and just saying, you know, you know what, you don't have to be the best of everything. You just got to get the right people in place and you got to, you know, chin check yourself and basically get your ego out of the way. Mm. And, and that was very hard for me. And Till today, sometimes that gets in the way, but I'm able to identify it. Yeah. And once I am able to identify it, it allows me to step back and say, hey, you know what? Let's reposition, regroup, and let's move forward. Yeah. And that has helped me by identifying those things. Gotcha. Because if not, you'll keep doing the same thing over and over, and it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, you're gonna sit there and realize, hey, it's not working, it's not working. Why is it not working? then your business starts to fail. But when you're able to identify these little things here and there, and that's the first step, and that's like the most important thing for me now in I life. That. So. Wow, that's awesome. These are some really crazy gold nuggets, dude. I'm telling you, I used to listen to podcasts. I still do listen to a ton. But when I was, you know, earlier on in my journey, yeah. and people would say little stuff, like you're dropping, like you're a golden nugget here, a golden nugget there. And those little golden nuggets would just change my life, man. Like I'd be driving down the road. I'd hear somebody say something that I could relate to, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, like that's, and I just go back and re-listen over and over and over again. So I appreciate you being honest and vulnerable yeah. because I think it helps so many people out there. And uh, man, I, I'm gonna shift gears just real quick for a minute. And then I know we're running a little long. We got to tour some houses and yeah. we got a bunch of stuff we're gonna do in the next day or so. But um, what, are, what are your thoughts on the housing market right now? And I know nobody's got a crystal ball yeah. and nobody knows what the heck, right? But you know, the next couple of years, the next five years, I mean, I know you said you're keeping, uh, well, how did you, you used a one-liner, you're keeping it dry, you're keeping the stash. Oh, keeping the powder dry. Keeping the powder dry, I like yeah. that. Um, you know, which means you're obviously staying liquid, right? Yeah. So what, what do you think, in your opinion, we're, we're looking at here? I, I think based upon the monetary policies and what's going on, I think we just printed way too much money. I, I think we're coming into hyperinflation at this point. I mean, you know that we're at, you know, core CPI at 9.1%. You know, everything is just getting more and more expensive. I think what's going to eventually going to happen is, you know, f the feds are going to have to raise rates above 9% to really slow down inflation. Then what happens is when people tend to, you know, slow down by spending money because now they need money to buy groceries. Now, if you take a look at a history of inflation, inflation never goes down. Mm. Once you have inflation, it's here to stay. So people are going to probably retract from buying homes. But I think on the renting side, you're gonna have more people leaning towards the renting side. I agree. So that that's kind of like my position, and that's why you know I'm stacking some of this powder dry because people got to live somewhere. But based upon where the market is going right now, I think we're gonna see a big dynamic shift, especially in Las Vegas. I can't really speak for the country because that's not my marketplace. Sure. As you know, real estate is very local, mm -hmm. and I only play in my backyard. So yeah, I like that, and I like that you pointed that out. I think a lot of people they take real estate and they they compare market to market. Yeah. And, a lot of them aren't comparable, right? Yeah. You know, you can't sit and compare a Vegas to a North Carolina yeah. or a, an Arizona to an Atlanta, Georgia. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not comparable. It's going to be a different market, right? And you know, you you see a lot of the big agents, like you said, people are watching Million Dollar Listing or yeah. they're watching 
uh, you know, selling Sunset on Netflix and, and they're looking at, you know, California or New York or whatever. And that might not be comparable to where they lived. Yeah. Right? And they've really got to, you got to dive in and be the master of your local market, I think, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Even like in Vegas alone, I mean, we have broken down the zip codes. We could talk about Las Vegas in a whole, but if you look at the data, you know, each zip code is completely different from others. So it's yeah. kind of even hard to even break it down from there. I mean, it's, sure. it's all completely local from communities, neighborhoods. It's crazy. Yeah. How many uh, active listings in Vegas would constitute a, as a healthy market, like a neutral market? That's a good question. Uh, according to the MLS, is roughly about 6,000. Okay. So uh, we literally dropped down to about 2,000 homes. But now we're currently sitting almost at 10,000 homes. The wow. average days on the market right now for a home is about 10 days. So we went from six days to 10 days. The median price point 60 days ago was at 485, and that was at an all time high. Wow. What could you have bought? 1,800 square feet, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, two car garage. Wow. In today's market, it's 470,000. It literally dropped 15,000 within a couple weeks. It's unbelievable. Wow. So, what you'll start to see is that um, homes are starting to de- decline pretty rapidly. So, sure. Yeah. And do you think that'll continue? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously. Yeah. I, I think it would be healthy for it, yeah. wouldn't it? I mean, and at the end of the day, I made a video where I'm like, man, like what we just went through is not healthy. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just simply not healthy. You can't have, dude, I remember looking at a house and every week this mm-hmm. estimate was going up 30, 40, 50 yeah. grand. It's like, come on, that's not sustainable. So I guess the question is, what is a market crash? And we had a debate with one of my friends yesterday on the show. You know, what really constitutes a market crash? A 30, 40, 50%? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Right. However, but there, there needs to be some sort of correction. But what is that correction and when do you actually buy? Well, you buy when you figure out, hey, does this actually make sense based upon the average household income? Because if you look in Las Vegas, the average right now is about 60000 At 480 I mean, that's yeah. almost like, dude, that's what, four or five times more of the income? Right. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. Well, I'm curious to see and, and uh, can't wait to see in all honesty. Yeah. You know, I, I'm looking forward to the market you know, changing. I'm looking forward to the market, you know, doing anything different than what it was doing. I think that it was cool, man, but you know, it was just, it wasn't healthy. Anybody could make money. Yes. Way too many people got into the industry, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, that should have never been in the industry. Um, And I think we kind of just need a little bit of a reset, I think. And I think no matter what happens, you know, sure, some people are going to make money, some people are going to lose money, but at the end of the day, objectively, I think it'll be healthy. Yeah, even on right. our, our agents, you know, they're working twice as hard just to make the same amount of money. Yeah. However, that's going to really weed out a lot of the agents that can't really produce because, like you said, you know, during the hype, everybody, every, everybody and their mom was a real estate agent and everybody was making money, right? So now it's like, I, I think it, it is a healthy thing. So. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, I know we're getting a little bit long here, so I'll wrap it up, man. I appreciate you being here. And uh, what you said you had another YouTube channel. So I know you got your main channel, right? Mm -hmm. What's the other one? What are you doing with that channel? So on that one is uh, Chuggets 2.0. And basically that's just a channel for more like for fans, people that are into real estate, entrepreneur, Las Vegas and business. And we just do vlogs of my life of like what's going on because I'm just your average guy, man. Right. So I, I just show you my trials and tribulations and what I go through as an agent. And I just bring people along with me. And that's pretty much it. I love that, man. I love that. Well, I'll put both of your channels probably down in the description below of all of the videos, all of the links, everything like that. I'll link your Instagram. Cool. Um, is there anything else that uh, that you want to leave us with or, or we wrap up and go tour some homes? Yes. Yeah, so here's the thing. We are currently working on a coaching program. In addition to the coaching program, we are also um, doing Teachable too as well. So basically, if you are an agent out there and you want to, learn how to build your business. I'm talking about seven figures through social media. We have a coaching program and also we're doing a full video course too as wow. well. So I love that. Well, we'll have to talk a little bit more after the show because we're working on some similar stuff right now nice. too. So uh, definitely go check out his course. He's an absolute rock star. Uh, hit him up. Let him know where you came from. And brother, I appreciate you being on the show, man. Thank you. I appreciate hey, you. Thank you. We'll see you guys in the next one.